be in John chapter 7. So if you got a Bible, John chapter 7 is where we're going to be. And if you're uh, in our app, uh, there's a lot of notes in there, tons of stuff, there's so many verses uh, that we're going to cover tonight. We're going to try to cover uh, 52 verses of chapter, uh, well, we're going to try to cover all of chapter 7, which is 52 verses, uh, or 53, depending on how you deal with that block of scripture. Um, but we'll we'll talk about that later. Um, <clears throat> so we in our little map here, we're in the section uh, about the four Jewish feasts, um, and so we're we're entering chapter seven now. Uh, chapter seven, <clears throat> all the way through the first part of chapter ten, is all about this one feast. All that stuff happens during this one feast. So obviously we're breaking that up into sections because we can't cover three chapters in one night, but, um, <clears throat> and this is all around the Feast of Tabernacles, so uh, we'll, we're going to dig into that and what that is uh, in just a few minutes. Now, uh, chapter 7 and 8 uh, is one section, and I found something that I didn't even know, I mean, it's the Gospel of John, you're always going to find more stuff you didn't know, little literary tricks that he's doing and things like that, and uh, so we talked about how uh, John will mention a detail, and then you don't hear anything about that detail until like three or four chapters later or two chapters later. Uh, he'll mention that same word again, and that's supposed to clue you in that, that he's framed that section for you. So like in, in this section, the portico is mentioned, the little or the colonnades in some translations, and then at the end of chapter 10, he mentions that again. So he's telling you that's one whole section. But chapter 7 and 8 has another little section within this section, uh, and it's by using the Greek word crypto, and uh, it means to be secretive or to do something in private. So if you read this passage, you've already seen the word, uh, you know, doing something in secret or in private, uh, and there's a contrast that's going on there. Um, So he mentions that in verse 4 of chapter 7, and then he's going to mention it again, at the end of chapter 8, and we're not going to get that far tonight, but I'm just kind of letting you know that this 7 and 8 is meant to be read as a whole thing, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> because of the length of this whole section of stuff, we're going to divide this into several parts, maybe three, it might have to be four, we'll kind of see. Um, now, it's going to begin with the discussion tonight, Is going to begin about Jesus talking to his brothers. So he's back at, at home. And he's having this discussion with his brothers, and that's going to reveal some things to us. Um, and then he's going to go to Jerusalem for one of these big feasts. Now, in the, in the Jewish world, you had uh, three, what they called a pilgrimage feast. So this, there were three feasts where all men were expected. You could take your family if you wanted to, but the men especially were expected to travel to Jerusalem for these three big festivals. And uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is one of those. And he does this on purpose, as we'll see. Uh, the things that Jesus is going to say in the temple are directly connected to this, this feast. Uh, so what that means is, and, and this is how I learned to um, uh, start studying the Bible a little bit deeper than I had before. Uh, when I was unemployed for a while, um, I had realized through the events of my life up to that point that I apparently have been missing some stuff in Scripture. I'm apparently missing a lot of important things to get in such bad shape that I was in. And uh, since I was unemployed and I didn't know what else to do, uh, I just opened to the Gospel of John and just started reading. And I was trying to read like I've never read this before. And uh, I kept getting to all these feasts that he mentions, and it seems like these feasts are important but I realized I don't know what happened at these feasts because John doesn't tell you, right? He's not going to, because he's writing to people who should already know this stuff, right? So I started researching what happens at these feasts, and then I realized, wow, what Jesus is saying is directly connected to something that was literally happening in front of them at the time. And then it just opens the whole thing up for you. So um, that's what I'm going to try to do tonight. Uh, this is going to be ongoing for the next few weeks because, you know, there's a lot of stuff in this. Um, but I want to kind of show you how knowing the historical context, the background, uh, is really important to help you understand more of what's going on. 
Now, you don't, it's not 100% necessary that you know all that. You can still get a lot out of the Gospel of John if you didn't know any of that stuff because John is very simple to read. Uh, but there's so much there under the surface that makes more sense out of it. So uh, we're going to try to do that tonight. Okay, you ready? Introduction over. Here we go. Verse 1. After this, which implies you need to know what happened before this, right? Remember we had the the whole bread of life discussion, the feeding of the 5,000, walking on the water, and there's a long discussion uh, in the synagogue about the bread of life thing, and and it, that's where he makes that bold claim, <clears throat> eat my flesh and drink my blood. If you don't, you're not going to heaven. <laughs> it was He didn't say it exactly like that, but pretty close. Uh, and everybody is like freaked out because they should be. But they decide because... They, don't, they thought following Jesus meant free food, not conflict. Uh, and when conflict arose, they, they all deserted him. And uh, it, it seems to imply that only the 12 uh, apostles were still with him at that point. So after all that, Jesus went about in Galilee, which is about uh, 60 miles north of Jerusalem. He would not go about in Judea, if that's where Jerusalem is, because the Jews were seeking to kill him, Right? We learned that in chapter 5. Remember, he healed the guy on the Sabbath, and we're told through that whole argument, because Jesus heals a guy on the Sabbath, they get in an argument, and then Jesus says everything he possibly could to make it worse. Remember that discussion? You know, they're talking about the Sabbath, and he's like, well, you know, my dad works on the Sabbath, and my dad is God, and all that. Then they decide, we got to kill this guy. Um, <clears throat> so he's, he's avoiding Jerusalem. So th- this implies... Some time has gone by since chapter 6, right? Uh, and specifically because chapter 6 was Passover and chapter 7 is Feast of Tabernacles. That's six months later, okay? So six months has gone by from the end of chapter 6 to this verse right here. All right, so the Jews are trying to kill him, and he says, Now the Feast of Booths, or Tabernacles, uh, was at hand. In Hebrew, this was called Sukkot, and that's the word for tent or tabernacle. Tabernacle just means tent or shelter, right? Um, Now, before we go any further, because a lot of stuff Jesus is about to do doesn't make sense completely without understanding what this feast was about, okay? Now, we're not going to go into Leviticus tonight, but if you were, in the notes I've gave you the references, you can go read in Leviticus 23. It outlines the feast, and uh, the feast of booths or tabernacles is part of that. Um, now, this was an eight-day feast, okay? So it, it's a party, it's an eight-day party. Uh, and there would be sacrifices that would happen each day, and then there were uh, food offerings that would be offered in the temple, and people would eat in the temple courts in celebration. And this entire thing was to celebrate how God provided for the Israelites in the wilderness. So the things that they would do at this feast reminded them of things that happened in that story in Exodus and in Numbers, right? The, those are the two books where the wilderness stuff is mentioned. Um, now, <clears throat> so they're celebrating food. It was also the celebration of the crop harvest because this, this happened um, toward the end of uh, around September, October on our calendar. Uh, and this is when the harvest was over and now they're hoping that rain comes so they can replant, right? Um, so there was a, there's all kinds of celebration. This specific feast was all about joy. It was, it was a joyous occasion for eight days, right? So they would start off, uh, day one, they wouldn't do, it'd be like a Sabbath day. So you would go to the temple, make an offering and all of that, but you weren't allowed to go to work. Uh, and then you would have days two through seven is a bunch of feast and partying and having a great time. And then day eight would be another Sabbath day, and there would be no work, and there'd be a sacrifice, and that kind of thing. Um, Okay, so there was a couple things that happened at this feast. And if you've read the passage already, and I'm not going to ask how many did, because I gave you a long passage and nobody ever does. Um, But uh, if you read this ahead of time, this would make sense to you. But uh, let me tell you a couple things that happened at this feast. Um, there's a little bit of discrepancy I noticed in the different scholarly stuff I read. Um, some of them say this happened every day, and then a lot of them said this happened on the eighth day, the last day. 
uh, what they would do as part of this is they would go out to the pool of Siloam and they would draw water and then there would be a procession. The people would, would go in a procession, kind of like you would go down the aisle at a wedding, you know, procession. Uh, and they would go from the pool of Siloam to the temple and there would be this ritual of pouring out water at the base of the altar. They would pour water around the altar. And this was uh, to remind them of the time when water came from the rock in the wilderness, remember that story, right? Moses hits the rock and the water comes out. And second time, God says, "Don't hit it. Speak to it." And he he's mad and he hits it. And all that kind of thing. Um, so that, there was this water ritual. The other thing that they did that we won't talk about in detail tonight, but I'll just kind of prep you for future discussion, is there would be a torch lighting ceremony in the temple, where they would light all these torches, and it was to remind them of how God led them by a pillar of fire in the wilderness, okay? So you're looking at me right now like, why do we need to know all this? When we start reading this passage, you're going to see why the, the whole water ritual was, was important, okay? All right, so now that you've got all that memorized, here we go, verse 3. But his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. So his brothers know he's doing some pretty cool tricks. He's, he's done some things and got some attention, you know. And they said, uh, for no one works in, in crypto, that's the Greek word there, secret, if he seeks to be known openly. So what are the brothers saying right now? They're saying, well, look, if you can do all this stuff, why are you being so secretive about it? You know, if you're if you think you're the Messiah, uh, why don't you go to down to Jerusalem? That's where the Messiah is supposed to show up, right? Remember, he's supposed to suddenly come into the temple, like the prophecies say in Zechariah. So, um, what are you doing, hanging out in Galilee and being on the down low about all this, right? He says, if if you do these things, show yourself to the world. Do you see the doubt in these brothers? If you're really doing these things by the power of God and it's not just a magic trick, man, go show off. Go tell everybody who you are. For not even his brothers believed in him. And we're meant to connect this back to the previous story. His own disciples desert him because they don't like what he just taught and it's going to cause conflict. So a big group of disciples left him. The very next story, we're told his own brothers don't even believe in him. Now, uh, I put the reference in your notes. Uh, here it is. Mark 3.21 tells us that Jesus' family thought he was out of his mind. Now, Mary knew who he was, Mary and Joseph, right? But Joseph was out of the picture uh, at some point in Jesus' life. We have no idea what happened to Joseph, okay? We assume he died. There's some traditions about it, but it means not Scripture, so who, who knows? Um, Joseph was still around when Jesus was 12, because Luke tells us that they f forgot him at the temple and didn't realize it till three days later. Um, but after that, no more mention of Joseph. So um, anyway, <clears throat> so we know Mary and Joseph were clued in on who he was before he was ever born, right? But his brothers, uh, they think he's nuts. There's several stories, like one time Jesus is teaching in somebody's house, and it says that Jesus' family was outside and they were trying to interrupt him and get him to come outside so they could talk to him. So you get the idea that they're like hearing what he's saying, and they're like, uh, no, you can't be going around saying that. Come out here. We, gotta, we need to advise you, Jesus. Um, so they thought he was, the brothers at least, they thought Jesus was crazy at first. All right? So Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. Oh, and by the way, Marty discovered this. The idea, uh, my time has not yet come, or my hour has not yet come. Anybody want to guess how many times Jesus says that in John's gospel? Seven. Yeah, you can almost guess, right, every time. Seven times that statement, uh, or some form of that statement, shows up. And um, <clears throat> But then the eighth time, he says, the hour has come. That's in chapter 12. But anyway, uh, he says, so my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. Uh, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me. And why does the world hate Jesus? Because he testifies about it that its works are evil. Okay, so apparently, according to Jesus, 
If you call out the world for its evil, it will hate you. Was he correct? <laughs> yes, yes. You can see that anywhere you look nowadays. Anybody that's trying to stand up and go, uh, this is wrong, this is bad, you're going to be demonized for that. And they're literally going to demonize Jesus here in a few minutes. So he tells his brothers, you go up to the feast. I'm not going up to this feast for my time has not yet fully come. Now, we're going to find out in a minute. He didn't really mean that because <laughs> he's going to go. Uh, so he says, y'all go ahead. I'm not going to go to this one. And he remained in Galilee for a while. Um, now, here's what I think's going on, because we know Jesus goes to the feast, we're told in the next part. Um, what Jesus is doing is he realizes, you know, the brothers are against him. They think he's crazy. They're trying to get him to go show off. Well, if you're going to go to that feast that they're also going to, would you want to travel with those people all the way 60 miles on foot to Jerusalem? Probably not. You probably want to send them on ahead and travel by yourself, right? You ever had to travel with somebody while you were in conflict with them? Married people? You ever got in an argument and then had to drive somewhere for an hour or two? It's quite awkward, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. So maybe that's what's going on here is Jesus is like, look, y'all got the wrong intentions in mind. Y'all head to the feast. I'll, I'll show up later, right? Okay. I feel like we could testify there about that marriage thing I just brought up, but we'll leave that for something else. Um, <clears throat> but after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up. So it's like he kind of tricked them into going on ahead. Uh, but, he, but not publicly, but in crypto, in private. Now, he says the Jews were looking for him at the feast, saying, where is he? So, I mean, they, they've... They've remembered what he did on the Sabbath months ago, and they've been trying to figure out where he's at, what is he doing, but he's been up in Galilee doing more cool stuff up there. So they're looking around for him, and there was much muttering about him, Jesus, uh, among the people. And some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. So you can see the, the tension here. You've got crowds of people that, I think he's a good teacher, I, I like him. And another crowd says, no, he's a false teacher, and he's leading people away from God, right? Uh, it's still going on today, isn't it? Like, you know, famous statement by uh, C.S. Lewis is um, he's either a liar, he's a lunatic, or he's Lord. And there's people in all three of those camps, right? Um, but for fear of the Jews, meaning the Jewish leaders, no one spoke openly of him. So they're kind of whispering and keeping their voice low talking about Jesus because they're afraid of their leaders. Uh, that should tell you something. If you're afraid of your religious leaders, there, there's got to be a problem, right? You should be afraid of your religious leaders, right? <clears throat> now, about the middle of the feast, so we don't know, is that, does this mean Jesus arrived in the, at the middle of the feast or did he just decide to show up in the temple? during the middle of the feast. So this would be like day four, maybe, of the, of the eight-day feast. Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. So he was, he was crypto a few minutes ago. He was, he was secret. But is he being secret now? No. He went up into the temple and began teaching. So this was common for rabbis to do. They would go in the temple courts, and they'd gather some people, and they would stand up. The people would sit down. He, they would stand up, and they would teach. Uh, and this could be going on in several areas. The, the Temple Mount was huge, like bigger than the football field kind of thing. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, when you could just read the word marveled, just think mind blown. Like they just could not figure this guy out. They said, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? That's a good question. How is this guy so good at this? But he's never studied. Now, they don't mean he never studied anything ever. What they mean is, how is this guy so smart with the Scripture, but he's never studied under us? That's what they mean. Because in that tradition, for you to be a rabbi, you had to be trained by another rabbi. You didn't just walk into the temple and claim you're a rabbi, right? You had to be trained by somebody. And Jesus is from Nazareth, from a poor family, He's clearly not been trained by any kind of uh, rabbi. So here's the issue, 
all right? It's not that Jesus is smart and how did he get so smart. It's Jesus is doing a really good job with this, but he didn't go through our little process. And he's making us look bad. And he's not a religious elite like we are. He's not in our camp. That's the problem. Make sense? Okay. Any of that still going on today? No. No. Doesn't happen in church today at all. Okay, moving on. Jesus answered them, "Uh, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether uh, the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. So uh, we kind of miss this because we don't understand how ancient rabbis worked. But when a rabbi would teach in the Jewish world, they would not teach on their own authority usually. What they would do is in their teaching, they would always be quoting the rabbis that trained them or other famous rabbis. Uh, If you go read the Talmud, which is the rabbinic writings that came much later after the New Testament, but they speak backwards into history, Um, it's all these rabbis discussing things with each other and quoting each other about different teachings. That's the culture of rabbinic school. Um, But Jesus isn't doing that. He's not like standing up and, you know, quoting from Rabbi Hillel or Akiva or any of the famous people at that time. He just stands up and teaches like, He's making it up, (laughs) and they're confused by that. And he's saying, look, if you were seeking God, you would know where my teaching comes from because it would sound familiar to you because God would have been saying the same things to you that I'm saying to you. He goes on, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. So in that culture, somebody stood up and said all this stuff, and they never had any, you know, backing from other rabbis then you would consider that person as somebody who's seeking their own glory, right? They're, they're being arrogant. He says, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. He's talking about the Father here. Has not Moses given you the law? Now, just listen to what this claim is. Hey, don't y'all have the law for Moses? But none of you keep the law. Who's he talking to right now? He's talking to the religious leaders, most likely the Pharisees. And he just said to the Pharisees, you don't keep the law. How's that going to go over? I mean, that would be like you going to church on a Sunday and standing up in the middle of the sermon and saying, you don't do what you're talking about. How's that going to go over? Not too good. And here's how it would go over. A group of men, church leaders, would probably take you to the side and have a meeting with you. And if you were Jesus, you would look at them and say, none of you are doing it either. (laughs) None of you are keeping the law. That's essentially what's going on. He's in the temple telling the leaders, you don't keep the law. These leaders think they actually keep the law. That's why they're so judgmental on the common people. It's because they think those people aren't keeping it, but we're keeping it, and we're doing a good job. They actually believe that. And he's, he's cutting right to the heart. And then he throws this in, why do you seek to kill me? Which I bet in that moment, they were probably thinking, shh, don't say that. We haven't exactly publicized that, Jesus. We didn't want people to know we were trying to kill you. Because they're not going to publicize that information, right? Because a lot of people really like Jesus. So you're not going to stand up in the temple and say, hey, that guy you like, we want to kill him, right? So they're keeping that on the down low, and Jesus is just blurting it out. You, know, you guys don't keep the law. Why do you want to kill me, right? Shouldn't you kill yourself because you don't keep the law? Why are you trying to kill me? The crowd, <laughs> this is their answer. You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Now, I almost didn't talk about this, but uh, it's just too good. We, we just got to talk about it. Notice what just happened, okay? And I'll put this in your notes somewhere. Here it is. <clears throat> Notice the reaction of this conflict and how it relates to how people react today, all right? An angry mob of powerful hypocrites responds with demonizing their opponent with false accusations and lying about their own secret intentions. Let me say that again. 
an angry mob of powerful hypocrites respond to Jesus' claim by demonizing him with false accusations. You have a demon. That's demonizing and a false accusation in one claim. And they li- they're lying about their secret intentions. Any of that going on today? Of course it is. The church, the people who are faithful in the church, are trying to say some things in our culture lately. Like, hey, this is wrong. This is bad. This is abusive. This should not be happening. This is a bad way to go. This should be illegal what you're doing right here. And an angry mob is demonizing us and then lying about what it is they're really trying to do, right? Okay, I'm just going to use an example, and we're not going to harp on it, but the whole drag queen shows for kids thing that's taken the nation by storm for some reason. We've been calling, people have been, Christian people have been calling that out and saying that shouldn't be going on. And then they're demonizing the church and saying, well, y'all are just transphobic, like we're scared of trans people. Like, oh, heck with it. Here we go. I'm not, I'm not scared of a trans person. Are you? Have you met one? <laughs> I'm not very, I'm not scared of trans people. I am scared of what their true intentions are. So when I say things like this, I'm not trying to be offensive. What I'm trying to say is, I think some people are after our kids. It's kind of obvious. But if you say things like that, this happens. <laughs> they lob false accusations, and then they lie about what they're really trying to do. That's the same thing. Now, that's, I just made a very modern uh, example out of an ancient text. I'm not saying that's what was going on here, but it's the same kind of things. When you call something out and they know they're wrong, their only option is to demonize and then lie about what they're really doing. And that's exactly what the Pharisees or whoever this group was, most likely the Pharisees, were doing. So they're like, no, you, you've got a demon and nobody's trying to kill you. What are you talking about? And Jesus answered them, I did one work. Now he's talking about back in chapter 5, the last time he was in Jerusalem when he healed the guy, right? I did one work and you all were mind blown at it right? And and then he brings this up, which is kind of funny to me. You know, Moses gave you circumcision. (laughs) If I'd have been standing there, I'd be like, where is he going with this one, right? (laughs) I mean, they just called you like demon possessed. You want to talk about circumcision? Moses gave you circumcision. um, Not that it was from Moses, but from the fathers, meaning it, it existed with Abraham. Like that whole practice started with Abraham. But these people are obsessed with Moses. The people that he's talking to, they're obsessed with Moses. And a lot of times they forget there's like a lot of scripture before Moses shows up. There's a whole book of the Bible that Moses is not in because he wasn't alive yet. That's called Genesis, right? And there's several occasions, by the way, Matthew 19 is one of these occasions where they're arguing about what Moses said about marriage and divorce. And you know where Jesus wants to take them? Genesis chapter 2. He's like, yeah, y'all are arguing about Moses. That came much later, right? That was a response to your sin problem. You can't start there. You have to go back. So he's kind of doing the same thing with the circumcision thing. But anyway, that's not the point. He says, look, you're you're mad at me because I did this work. Remember that thing on the Sabbath I did? You're mad about that. But... You know, you circumcise people on the Sabbath, don't you? To which we read that and we go, I don't even know what's going on here. Just realize a Jewish person on the eighth day when a baby was born, a a male baby, because they had males and females back then. Um, (laughs) Sorry, I was watching Daily Wire earlier, earlier, so it's kind of in my brain. Um, A male child would be born, and on the eighth day you would bring them Uh, to the temple, and you would dedicate them, and they would be circumcised on the eighth day, okay? If that eighth day fell on the Sabbath, they would still do that, right? Okay? And that's what he's drawing attention to. He's like, hey, don't you, uh, if if the eighth day happens to fall on the Sabbath, don't you circumcise that child, right? You don't go, oh, nope, it's a Sabbath, and we can't do this on the Sabbath, because that's work. 
<laughs> right? They, so by their own definition, this is what Jesus is doing. You guys are hypocrites. By your own definition of what you're mad at me about, you work on the Sabbath too. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, which it's funny he says a man there. I think he'd say a baby. <laughs> but, uh, here's the other thing. If you were a Gentile and you wanted to become a Jew and be faithful to Yahweh and you're a man, this was your initiation. They don't have a lot of Gentile converts is what I'm getting at. <laughs> right? They had this whole argument in Acts chapter 15 when all the Gentiles were becoming Christians and the Jewish Christians were like, well, they got to get circumcised, don't they? <laughs> and one of the apostles says, I don't think we should make it difficult for the Gentiles to become Christians. That was like a very loaded statement. <laughs> Let's, let's not make it that difficult to become a Christian, okay? That hasn't worked out so well in the past, the Jewish faith. Anyway, whole different deal. He says, so if on the Sabbath a man receives circ circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken. So you're going to work on the Sabbath so you're not breaking circumcision laws, right? So you're breaking a law to keep the law. That's what he's pointing out. By their definition, they are. Uh, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? You see what he did there? He's saying, look, <laughs> you cut one body part. You could say it this way. You guys injure people on the Sabbath. I healed a guy, and not just one part of him, I healed all of him. Why are you mad? Do you see how he's such a he's a genius? Jesus knows exactly how to pick apart their argument and say, look, you guys are doing the same thing you're accusing me of, except you're doing it the opposite direction. You cut people on the Sabbath and I heal them. But you won't kill me, right? Y'all must love to use knives, right? You cut certain parts on the Sabbath and you want to kill me too, right? Okay, that was funnier in my head. Anyway, verse 24, he says, Do not judge by appearances. Now, now he's coming back to their original charge that how do you know all this stuff and you've never studied under us, right? Don't judge by appearances, the surface level stuff. Judge with right judgment, literally righteous judgment, okay? So he's telling them, you guys are focused on the wrong things, Right? I mean, you work on the Sabbath too, but you want to kill me for healing the guy on the Sabbath. You want to criticize me because I, hasn't, I haven't been trained in your specific school of training. You're judging by the wrong criteria. Make sense? All right? He's pointing out their hypocrisy over and over again. Some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, is not uh, this the man whom they seek to kill? So they've been trying to be secretive about this, but word's kind of gotten out. Plus, he just said it out, Jesus said it out loud in front of everybody, so kind of messed it up. So isn't this the guy they want to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Could it be that the authorities really know that he is the Christ? So you got a crowd of people, and there's thousands of people at these festivals, right? And they're, they're kind of talking around amongst themselves, don't they want to kill, arrest and kill that guy and he's here just talking out in the open and nobody's arresting him? Do you think maybe that they know he's the Messiah and they're lying to us about it? So you can see the commotion, the tension that's, that's coming up here. He says, but we know where this man comes from, and talking about Jesus, and when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. Now, that should make you like stop and think, why, why would they think that nobody knows where the Messiah comes from? Because the Old Testament's pretty clear, right? He was going to be born in Bethlehem, right? He's going to come from the line of David. He's going to grow up in Galilee. All of that was in the Old Testament. So, but I went and did some studying on the intertestament period, and I found out there were certain groups of people who were teaching this idea of a secret Messiah, that when the Messiah showed up, nobody would have a clue who he is and where he came from. So there were groups of people who were thinking that. 
And apparently, here they are. <laughs> they were at the feast too. So Jesus proclaimed as he taught in the temple, you know me and you know where I come from. He's like, y'all know me, I'm Jesus. Y'all, y'all know my parents. You know I was raised in Nazareth, right? Born in Bethlehem, all that stuff. Uh, but I have not come of my own accord. He who sent me is true, and him you do not know. Do you see what he just said? He just said, you guys don't know God. Because they already know that he's been saying that the Father, God the Father has sent him. He's been saying that for three chapters now, right? So he just told a group of religious leaders at a Jewish religious festival, you guys don't know God. You can kind of see why they want to kill him, right? And he says, I know him, for I come from him, and he sent me. I don't know how much clearer you could be, right? So they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him. I always love it when I read that, because like they're scared of him. <laughs> because his hour had not yet come. There it is again. Yet many of the people believed in him. And they said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? What they're saying here is, we've never met or even read about anybody in the Old Testament that can do what this guy's doing. Like, is there anybody that's going to come do more than this? He's, this has got to be the Messiah. The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priest and Pharisees sent officers, officers to arrest him. Jesus then said, I will be with you a little longer and then I'm going to him who sent me. Now this phrase in yellow here on the screen should have triggered their minds to an Old Testament passage. You will seek me, and you will not find me. Where I am, you cannot come. Okay, now what they should have known is he's, he's quoting from the Old Testament, except he changed something. Right? You might have, this phrase might sound familiar to you. You shall seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. You ever heard that passage before? Okay, these guys would have heard it and taught it many times. Okay? This is from, uh, lost my place in my notes. This is from Isaiah uh, 55 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. There's another place in Isaiah, I think it's in chapter 5. I might have that wrong. Uh, Seek the Lord and you'll find me when you seek me with all your heart, right? So they should have been clued into that. But instead of seek seek the Lord (laughs) while he may be found, he says, you will seek me, but you won't find me. And by the way, where I'm going, you're not allowed to go. (laughs) They should have got it, but of course, they're completely confused. They don't know what the heck he's talking about. The Jews said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? What's he talking about? I mean, is he like hide-and-seek world champion? What is he talking about right here? He's going to go somewhere where we can't find him. Does he intend to go to the dispersion? Sometimes it's called the diaspora. That's where the Jews were scattered after the exile in the Old Testament. There were Jews all over the Roman Empire uh, by this time. So that's what they're talking to, talking about. Is he planning on going to the Greek towns and teaching the, those dirty Gentiles? Like, is that what he's talking about right now? What does he mean by saying, you will seek me and you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? What's this guy talking about? Where's he going to go we can't find him, and why can't we go there? What is he talking about? And he doesn't explain it, <laughs> right? Uh, verse 37, Now there, there's a, so we were at the middle of the feast in that whole section. Now we're fast-forwarding to the last day. So some days have went by between verse 36 and verse 37. On the last day of the feast, remember I told you about what happens on the last day of the feast? They draw water and bring it into the temple. The, the great day, uh, that can also be translated the loud day. So on the last day, the loud day, Jesus stood up and was loud. You see it? He cried aloud. If anyone thirsts, 
let him come to me and drink. Now, what do you think was happening in the temple when he said that? They were pouring water around the altar because that's what they did during this feast, right? And they especially did it on the last day. So he's, everybody's watching this go on, and Jesus is real loud because singing would have been going on. That's actually pretty good evidence they were singing from Isaiah 12 uh, at this moment. And Jesus interrupts that and like cries out in a loud voice. Uh, the word for cried out is kratzo. It's where we get our word crazy. So he's like yelling out, making a scene. If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. While they're pouring out water and remembering that God uh, provided water from the rock in the wilderness. So what's he claiming? He's claiming to be the rock. If anyone's thirsty, I'm the rock that gives you water. Come to me and drink. <clears throat> Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly, it's not heart. I don't know why the ESV puts heart, because the Greek word for heart is cardia. And that's not the word here, it's kolia. I don't know if that's where we get the word colon from, I'm not sure. But um, it, it refers to the whole body cavity, uh, di digestive system, everything. Right? So out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. And that doesn't mean he has diarrhea, okay? Um, I didn't think of that till just this moment. Probably shouldn't have said it, but there we go. Okay, so, all right, so they're pouring out water on the altar, remembering when God provided water from the rock. And he says, if anyone's thirsty, come to me and drink. And then he quotes a scripture. Now, it took me all day, one day this week, I spent the whole day trying to figure out what is he doing right here. Because if you look up that quote, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water, it's nowhere in your Old Testament. But he's quoting it as if it is in your Old Testament. So it took me a while to figure out what is he doing here because it's not a direct quote. Here's what he's doing. He's taking a bunch of Old Testament ideas and combining them all into one. And by the way, John's writings, he does this several times. In Revelation, he does it all over the place. He'll take different things from different books in the Old Testament, put them all into one statement and as if it's a single quote, right? So Jesus is doing this here. Now, so here's what we need to do. Before we go any further on that, I want to take this cried out thing and show you what John intends for us to get, okay? Um, remember in John chapter 1, we're told that Jesus is the Word, right? The Logos or Logos, all right? That Greek word means divine wisdom. So he's the wisdom of God, Okay? Now, is there a book in your Old Testament that's completely about wisdom? Proverbs, right. Well, it's more than one, but for sure Proverbs is focused on wisdom. Uh, let me just read you a couple verses. Uh, Proverbs 1.20 says this, Wisdom cries aloud in the street. Somebody's doing it right now, crying aloud, screaming out there. I don't know who that is. Uh, so, so come back in here for a minute. <laughs> Wisdom cries aloud in the street. In the markets, she raises her voice. Sound familiar? So the wisdom stood up and cried aloud in a public space. Proverbs 124, it says, I have called out. In other words, I have cried aloud, but you refuse to listen. That's what wisdom is saying in Proverbs. Um, if Jesus is the wisdom of God, uh, then Jesus is the main character of the book of Proverbs. It just uses the pronoun she. It refers to wisdom as a she in the Proverbs. But Jesus is the representation of God's wisdom here on earth. So when you're reading Proverbs and you're like, where is Jesus in all this? The whole book is about him. It's basically like reading Jesus' sermon in Proverbs because he's the word. Right? He's the wisdom. Now, um, <clears throat> let's figure out this, this whole water coming out of his belly thing. What is, what is all that about? Uh, let me just do it this way. Okay? 
Uh, if you go read these passages, Ezekiel 47 is a vision, is Ezekiel's vision of this future temple. And it's this massive temple, and there's, there's a river of life flowing out of this temple, and it's watering the land, and everything it touches sprouts life, right? There's trees on both sides that are yielding fruit constantly because the river of life is running between them, right? And that river is coming out of the temple. That's what Ezekiel sees. And that temple was never built, the one that Ezekiel saw, um, because it was massive, okay? Joel uh, 3.18 says the same kind of thing, that a river of life will come out of the house of the Lord. That's the temple, right? Zechariah 14.8 talks about the river of life coming out of Jerusalem. Where was the temple sitting? In Jerusalem, right? Except the temple they're talking about never got built, right? The temple Jesus is standing in during this story is not the temple they saw. That's never happened yet, right? Uh, Proverbs one twenty three says, I will pour out my spirit to you. So the spirit is spoke of like water. Hmm. Revelation 22.1, the new creation, there's a river of life flowing through the city and there's trees on both sides and it's called the tree of life but it's on both sides of the river and it's constantly yielding fruit that's in revelation so let's back up to john's gospel john 114 says the word became flesh and tabernacled among us right templed among us and then in john chapter 2 jesus walks into the temple and says he's the temple now Remember, destroy this temple, and I'll raise it up in three days. They think he's talking about the building. And John says, no, actually, Jesus was talking about his own body as the temple. Okay? And just so happens in John 19, 34, after Jesus dies, a soldier walks up to the cross to check to see if he's dead, and what does he do? Takes a spear, and he drives it into his side. Now, if you're hanging up this way, and you're on the ground, what part of the body do you think the spear is going to go into? Somewhere around here, right? And what comes out of Jesus? Water and blood. Water is coming out of his belly at the end of John's gospel. I think that's what Jesus is talking about. But he's not talking just about literal water, is he? Because all over the Old Testament, the Spirit is described with water language. Even on page one of your Bible, right? The Spirit is hovering over the face, the surface of the waters, right? So even from page one, Spirit and water is connected all the time. So what is this river of life? Well, the good news is this. John tells us in the very next verse. Now this he said about the Spirit, that whole water coming out of his belly thing and the Come to me for uh, if you're thirsty, and I'll give you living water. That was about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Remember, after Jesus rises from the dead and he meets with his disciples, he breathes on them. Remember the word for breath is the same Hebrew word for spirit, ruach. He breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. So John is looking back at this story and saying, now everybody in the temple was confused, but we, we figured it out afterwards. After the resurrection, we realized, because we did that 40-day Bible study with Jesus, and he taught us what all this meant. The water thing is all about the Spirit. Make sense? Do you see what Jesus is doing here? <clears throat> when they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. And they're talking about the prophet like Moses from Deuteronomy 18. God told Moses, I'm going to send a prophet like you. So that's what they're thinking. He's the prophet. Others said, this is the Messiah, the Christ. And then some said, wait, is the Messiah going to come from Galilee? Really? So you've got groups of people here that think he's different characters. They don't realize that he's all of them. He is the prophet like Moses, and he's the Messiah. In their minds, those were two different people. 
the prophet would come, the Messiah would come, right? There would be different people. Jesus is all of them. But there, <laughs> some of them are like, wait a minute, that, the Messiah is not going to come from Taylor County. That's essentially what they mean here. They don't look positively on Galilee, okay? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, you know, and Micah, and all those prophecies? The village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him, over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. He told us that twice in this story. They really wanted to arrest him, but they wouldn't dare try. There's thousands of people there, and a lot of people like him, right? The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said to them, <laughs> uh, where's Jesus? Why didn't you bring him? Right? Because they sent people to go arrest Jesus, and he's still standing there teaching all this stuff about water coming out of his belly and stuff. And they hear all this, and they come back to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they're like, uh, you're supposed to arrest him. Where is he? And the officers answered, um, nobody ever did sermons like this before. <laughs> Nobody ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? Do you see their elitist arrogance here? Hey, if we don't believe him, you shouldn't. I mean, come on, guys. Does, does any of the Pharisees believe this guy? I mean, think it through. But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Do you see how they felt? about the common people in their own city. These were the pastors of the community, and they look down their noses at the common population and say, these people are cursed because they're stupid. If they believe that guy, they must be stupid. Pastors have changed a lot. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's a lot of great pastors, but there's some. You've probably met them. You met me. I mean, I've been bad at this too. Anyway, now, okay, so have any of the Pharisees believed in him? Have we met a Pharisee in John's gospel who might be believing in him? Mm -hmm. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before and who was one of them, so he, he's still a Pharisee, he said to them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? You kind of see Nicodemus is starting to be a believer. In chapter 3, he came at night. He's all secretive. He didn't want anybody to know he's even going to ask Jesus a question. He's confused through the whole conversation. And then we're just left hanging on that, and then he shows up here again. And he's defending Jesus, but in kind of a roundabout way. He's saying, hey, guys, um, is it lawful for us to condemn a man without a fair trial? Aren't we supposed to listen to him? Aren't we supposed to do this right? And look how they treated Nicodemus. Are you from Galilee too? That would have been an insult, by the way. Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Now, when I read that phrase, because I've been reading Isaiah like crazy and these a lot of the Old Testament prophets, as soon as I read that, I knew that they were wrong. These guys were Bible scholar experts, highly trained for their entire life. And they completely missed a passage somehow where it clearly says, it's in Isaiah chapter 9, it clearly says that he would come from the area of Galilee. How'd they miss that? It's Isaiah chapter 9 verses 1 and 2. It's the famous passage, for unto us a child is born and a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders and will be called Wonderful Counselor, yada, yada, right? That famous passage, it begins by saying he's coming from Galilee of the Gentiles. It flat out says it, and I don't know how they missed that because in their minds they're thinking, search the scriptures and see he's not going to come from Galilee. And I wonder if Nicodemus was sitting there going, uh, Isaiah? Because <laughs> he's been thinking this through. Right, if you watch The Chosen, um, they man, they did such a good job with the episode where Nicodemus meets Jesus at night because they show a different side 
of that story that we might not have thought about before, that maybe he was genuinely trying to find out, is Jesus really the one? Maybe he wasn't as much of an enemy as we thought. And here you see him defending Jesus. At Jesus' death, who, is, who buries Jesus? Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, right? They're the ones responsible for going and asking Pilate if we could have his body and give him a proper burial, which was unheard of for a person who was executed. It would have been thrown in Gehenna, the valley outside of the city. Right? <clears throat> All right, so here's the conclusion. In John's gospel, Jesus is the new temple who gives the spirit of life. All right, I probably didn't tie this together as well, but that whole thing about out of his belly will come rivers of living water, well, if Jesus is claiming to be the temple in chapter 2, he makes this claim in chapter 7, which is connected to all these passages about the Spirit and the temple. And he says, come to me and drink. Then he's saying the river is going to come out of him. And if at the end of the gospel it literally does come out of him and he gives the Spirit to the disciples, then Jesus is the new temple who gives us the Spirit of life. And those who drink Jesus, to use his words, that means to trust in him, We'll receive the Spirit, and if it's the Spirit of life, that means we get eternal life, right? So do you see how much theology we just went through in one chapter of John's Gospel? This thing is loaded. That's why it's one of my favorite books. But there is a lot there, and I know it's like a fire hydrant. But when you read these passages, anytime Jesus is talking about water, or any, anything, anytime water is mentioned in John's gospel, you need to be thinking spirit. Because we were just told, well, he said all these things because he was talking about the spirit. So here's what we need to do for the rest of this week, or really the rest of your life. <laughs> you need to be thinking about, am I cultivating in my life the presence of the spirit in my life? Because God's not going to force himself on you. You have to be a willing participant in the work of the Spirit in your life, right? Right? We don't just pray, you know, God sanctify me and make me holy and lead me by your Spirit, and then we just go live however we want and then blame Him for not doing what we asked, right? That's not how this works. That's how a lot of Christians operate, but that's not how this works. What we ought to be doing is every day is drinking in more Jesus, right? And we, we literally do that every Sunday through communion. We drink Jesus, right? The reason we do that is it's a sign of what we're praying for. It's what we're asking for. More of the Spirit in my life. That's what I want. Because without that, Jesus would say, you can do nothing. Abide in me, I will abide in you. Just as a branch has to abide in the vine, you have to abide in me. For apart from me, you can do nothing. That's John 15. You can tell I've read it a few times. That's what it's about. I know I'm kind of re-preaching Sunday sermon here, but listen, listen close. Abiding with him is what the Christian life is about. That's where it's at. So the more we seek that, you're not going to always get it right. There's going to be days where you feel like he's a million miles from you. Um, read the Bible. Lots of people felt that way in the Bible. David wrote the Psalms. There's a lot of Psalms where he goes, where are you? <laughs> Why are you so far from me? That's a common thing. What you do, though, is you get up the next day and you try again. And you get up the next day and you seek him again. And you keep trying to abide with him. You keep drinking him in through his word because Jesus is the word, right? We read the word. We stay faithful to him, and we keep abiding with him. And you will start to see the Spirit doing things on the inside of you that will eventually work its way out of you. And you'll bear fruit, and it'll be good for everybody. Yes? Make sense? All right. Next week, we're going to cover this passage. Uh, it's a very famous passage, um, and it's, it starts in chapter 7, verse 53 and goes to uh, chapter 8, verse 11. So this is a shorter, it's just one paragraph. Um, and it's the famous passage of the woman caught in adultery. 
and they want to stone her to death, and Jesus saves her. Um, so there's a lot of stuff around this passage. If you've got a modern translation, there'll be a footnote there that says this story is not in uh, many of the manuscripts of John. And so we're going to have to deal with that issue and kind of explain what all that means and what, what's going on there. Um, but I personally believe this is Scripture. Um, it might be in the wrong part of the Scripture. Uh, maybe should have been later in John's Gospel or in Luke's Gospel or whatever. But either way, uh, the church as a whole, um, for centuries and centuries and centuries, believed this story happened and it should be in your Bible. So we're going to go on that assumption, uh, and we're going to talk about that next week. So go read that passage and uh, pay attention to what's going on there. Jesus is going to like doodle in the, on the ground, right? And everybody's going to just suddenly walk away. Um, so here's your homework. Figure out what Jesus wrote on the ground. That's your homework. You only have one question. So it's going to be a pop quiz next week. One question. So you got to get it right or you totally fail. Okay? Go figure out what's he writing on the ground and why did that make everybody leave. Okay? That's what we'll cover next time.